What's up, Hemp Nation? Thanks for tuning in this week for another episode of Hemp 101. And this week, you guys are in for a treat. We've got none other than the CEO and founder of Wick and Mortar, Jared Mursky. Now, Jared's crushing it out there in the cannabis space with his marketing firm, but off, he's got a lot of stuff in the works, and we talk about that today in this week's episode. I was actually nervous to get on the, the call with him today because the little secret, I was late to the last call, and I'm really lucky that he jumped on the call with us. So another shout out to you, Jared, for being super cool and looking out for us little guys, You know, whether we're doing it solo like me or you got the power of a marketing firm behind you like you, uh, you know, cannabis and hemp, we're all in this together. So without further ado, we have a great talk, great episode for you guys coming up. We talk about marketing, we talk about packaging, we talk about a whole bunch of stuff. So stay tuned. Here we go. It's Jared Mursky on Hemp 101. All right, everyone, welcome to the show. We've got Jared Mursky with us. He's joining us from Seattle, Washington. I'm currently traveling. I'm in Las Vegas. It's hot. It's very hot today. It's also hot in, uh, in Washington. And, you know, he's wearing his AC up there trying to stay cool. I'm inside <laughs> trying to stay cool as well out of the heat. So uh, today our guest is the CEO and founder of Wick and Mortar and none other than Jared Mursky. How's it going? It's going amazing. Thank you for having me, Lance. I'm digging the shirt, man. What kind of shirt? It, what, who is that? Um, it's made by a company called, uh, manufactured by, uh, the underachievers. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty bright looking shirt, man. I know. It's one of my favorite shirts. I don't wear it very often, but, uh, it was, it's really hot out. So I wanted something that was just a little, a little loose and breezy. Cool. I got to go. get a new microphone, man. I got to <laughs> get one as soon as I get back. Yeah. I have this one. It's a blue Yeti as well. Yep. Um, but I've got this, like this stand, this, uh, that comes with you can get and I've got it connected to my desk so it's really nice um, and it just makes it so much better because it's not on my table and it doesn't block a bunch of shit that's I know the my goal, cords man. aren't getting fucking moved around either <laughs> right that's the goal I was looking at the those sure the seven yeah. those yep. things, like 400 bucks fuck yeah I'm, I've, <laughs> I've got six of them on the way for my office podcast setup nice nice but I can't oh, yeah. use them right now because we are not going into the office for another month or so really yeah so like uh, vegas is five. like phase two opening up and then yeah. oregon is phase two are you, are you guys starting to open up already um a couple places but not really it's all outside so it's phase 1.5 what are you doing in vegas <laughs> uh funny you ask um a friend of mine from oregon uh knows uh a guy who's in the space uh, us three are joining up uh you know to start a brand uh down here in vegas so you know i came down here to visit the lab um, you know, see what, uh, what the capacity is of the lab, you know, what the, the current status of, of the lab is and, you know, send samples off to the lab for testing and then launch the products. It's exciting times. <laughs> it is. It is. So enough about me. Let's ask the, the, the overarching question for a lot of the cannabis users out there. Are you a flower guy or a concentrate guy? I am both. I like flower and concentrates. I've got a nice jar of nuggery here. You know, joints nice. here, and I've got my dab. <laughs> my dab rig is back there with my you, email attached to it. At you all got times. the email. I hear those things that are worth their weight in gold. Yeah, so uh, we uh, we work with a company called Mini Nail. So I've got a ton of these things, a bunch at my office, and a bunch of my couple at my house, and uh, yeah, they're they're great. <laughs> yeah, but I guess you get a lot of the the products from the the brands that are trying to market. So you know, merch, free merch, and uh, you know, helping these guys out get their their brand out there. Um, so speaking of which, hey, there's nothing like being a product tester, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh yeah. So you got well. So you're currently doing marketing with Wick and Mortar. How did you get started in the cannabis space? Uh, well, I started my first agency when I was 19, called Mursky Media. Uh, we were just really focused on small businesses. Uh, but because I was working a lot within the nightlife industry, providing them services on the creative and marketing side, uh, naturally as the industry, well, as I would say, black market uh, retailers or, or dispensaries started kind of popping up, uh, I was just happened to meet a lot of these people because they were going out and they were clubbing, right? And they were partying. And so um, they uh, didn't really have any creative services. There were none that really existed, nor that had a focus on cannabis. So I was like, hmm, interesting. A friend of mine had once told me that, you know, if I had ever had an opportunity to focus my creative skills on uh, a niche category that I should 
pursue that. And so I recognized cannabis as that opportunity, uh, luckily early on enough to develop the first cannabis focused branding and marketing firm, which is in the world, which is now um, uh, Wick and Mortar. So and it's a, it's a good brand. You know, I, I, I follow that. you guys. I follow you guys. I follow you on Instagram. You know, you're doing good work over there, man, because that's a lot of, uh, you know, the headache that is the, the barrier to entry, if you will, into the cannabis spaces. Can you get your brand out there? Can you get people to come back for more, et cetera? So how have you seen the branding evolution in cannabis over the years? Well, as each state has emerged, you know, you've got some that are vertically integrated, some that are not. So there's a bit of a disconnect between each state's rules and regulations, primarily because of the politics. But when you look deeper, each state is really trying to navigate the space in an effort to benefit their own state better. But I think as the future looks, you know, states will start to recognize those that are performing well in certain areas and those that are not. And because I've helped write legislature for a number of states with respect to packaging rules and like regulations, uh, I understand the confusion around certain things. Like as an example, um, I think it's a huge waste to have flower products uh, and joints CR certified. Because if a child is old enough to know how to smoke weed, they're old enough to know how to open up child resistant packaging. So if a child were to eat weed, which they wouldn't because it tastes like shit, uh, they're not gonna get high. But if they fed it to their dog or their cat, well then their dog or their cat's in for uh, you know, a trip uh, because they digest it differently than humans do. But that said, huge waste of uh, 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 plastics, uh, materials, um, in addition to uh, money. You know, if we're all trying to make cannabis more affordable, why do we need to spend more money on, uh, you know, packaging solutions that are not necessary? Um, but again, that's just my opinion. However, uh, as the, you know, each, as, again, as each state, uh, you know, emerges, much like, you know, each country, Canada and each province, again, they're always going to have their different set of rules and regs. And until federal legalization happens, you're not going to see, you know, enough near consistency uh, to really be able to navigate a national brand into each state um, as well, easily as most of, brands, most of the brands in the traditional space. What are current cannabis brands doing wrong in your eyes? Well, uh, I think a lot of what cannabis brands aren't doing is diversifying their products into segmented categories that ultimately result in uh, a much larger success point with respect to how they enter into not only retail, but also big box retail or even the, the, the end goal, and that's an acquisition. Because if you look at you know, the traditional space and you look at P&G and L'Oreal and Unilever and Pfizer and, you know, LVMH and Caring Group, and they all focus on very specific niche categories. LVMH, you know, they have Louis Vuitton and Belvedere and a number of other brands that fit within these different market segments, but they don't own the factories their products are manufactured in. They just own the IP and the brand. And so, for that reason, they're able to churn out more and more brands and spend the money they can to manufacture the marketing opportunities they do because they're not worried about keeping the lights on and people employed in a facility that's also manufacturing products for other companies, right? So why take on that burden of having that asset when you can quite literally do the same thing in a much larger format and spend more on what matters and that's marketing and branding and um, formulations and intellectual property, uh, you know, and really just defining what those are and then really segmenting those brands. Because again, if you're looking at, you know, uh, let's say Walgreens, you know, if you're talking about the oral care category versus, you know, this is kind of a, you know, no different than CBD or, you know, THC, but this is where it's going to move. You know, you're going to have a category buyer that's focused on, uh, you know, oral care and you have a category buyer that's focused on, um, cosmetics, right? And you have another, and, and health and beauty, right? And you have another category by that's, that's focused on beverages, right? So if you have one brand that's named the same thing and it has all three of those product categories, you have to convince all three of those people to buy you, not just one. But if you segmented your brands, you only need to convince one category to buyer to buy that one category is where your other brands have their own brand and fit with their own category. Does that make sense? Of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, because so, you don't, you don't want to sell a tincture to somebody who needs toothpaste. That's right. 
And <laughs> not to mention, if you're, if you're a brand that sells pet products and human products and everything under the sun, you appear to be so disconnected. Like it's obvious you're white labeling your shit. Like it's exactly. so obvious. Mm -hmm. And a consumer sees right through that. And that's when they go, eh, you're just the same as everyone else because everyone else is doing everything under the sun as well. But if you start creating niche focused products, the optics of that to a consumer convey that you are 100% focused on creating formulations with respect to the intention of the brand, right? The differentiating value proposition. Oops. And that is, you know, is it going to give you more sleep? Is it going to give you energy? Is it, uh, it going to get rid of your headache? Is it going to reduce inflammation? You know, is it going to help with ex uh, eczema? You know, what, what, are, what is the intention? What is the formulation for, right? Um, so again, you know, I think being niche focused is what brands need to be doing. They need to be spending more money on branding and marketing and not necessarily rely relying on, you know, building out their own facilities and obtaining licenses, which I think is great if you only want to focus on one state, but lease the building at least. Mm -hmm. Don't buy it because when cannabis goes federally legal, border crossing in relation to distribution is going to happen and there won't be a need for all of these farms because companies with much larger um, spending, uh, but with much larger manufacturing facilities are going to be able to, you know, ship out of state, no problem and still keep costs low because they're doing it on a much larger scale. Oh yeah, I agree. Yeah. You know, what the guys that have the access to the rails, you know, the central part of the country, you know, Midwest and stuff like that, you know, uh, the industrial hemp is really kind of flourishing in that area just because of the, you know, the geography and whatnot. So speaking of geography, the geography of the CBD space. So I'm sure you obviously you're paying attention to it. It seemed like a whole bunch of people like an exodus just kind of flooded the market. Where do you see the CBD industry kind of going? Obviously, we're waiting on the FDA approval. Um, same as same as I just described THC, literally the same. Um, it's just THC is based on distribution opportunities in relation to either the state you manufacture your own product in, um, through your own license or through white labeling or rather licensing deals. So you build your brand and you license it to other cultivators. Um, but in, in CBD, this, the same thing I explained in THC needs to occur and that's developing these niche focused brands. Again, there are major mass market niche focused brands. If you look at Diapers, right? <laughs> yeah. Diapers, babies are going to keep shitting and so are seniors. So <laughs> right. at the end of the day, diapers aren't going anywhere, but it's still a niche mass market, right? Yeah. And babies aren't buying their diapers. Their parents are. If, if you focus on that niche, that niche market, you're good to go. So once the FDA kind of goes into, uh, you know, really into the space and there's more research going out for the medical community, how do you see the CBD landscape changing more towards the supplement side versus the medical side? Do you see big pharma coming in and adopting a CBD program or a cannabis program? Well, first and foremost, you have to note that CBD is got a very similar effect to that of like grapefruits or grapefruit juice. The reason why doctors recommend pregnant women avoid uh, completely avoid drinking grapefruit juice or eating grapefruits is because um, what it does is it prevents your liver from creating enzymes that break down uh, you know, medications and prenatals. And so if you're taking more of something that is unable to break down un unconsciously because you're just taking it on your normal uh, schedule, but your liver's like, uh-uh, <laughs> we ain't breaking it down, you're overdosing. Like, so the interesting thing is that um, CBD, is 10 times more potent than grapefruit juice. So nothing's getting processed. So you really have to be careful about how you're consuming CBD in relation to other things you might be taking. So, you know, if you're taking things in combination or as a substitute, you know, you need to really, you know, talk to your doctor. Um, and so there's a huge disconnect between that piece of information and what people are actually selling. So, uh, when you look at um, CBG and CBN, well, those are okay because you know, CBG, CBG, you know, um, is more of an anti-inflammatory, where CBN is more of a sleep aid, mm -hmm. right? And and those, um, you know, don't affect the liver like CBD does. Uh, and so those are just things to to remember. But um, if you're developing a brand that is meant for human consumption, right? Those you ingest it. 
try and stick with CBG and CBN if you intend on taking that brand into any big box retailers, uh, at least right now. And, and until CBD is federally legal for human consumption, most big box retailers more than likely will not sell your product or you'll have to, or it'll be very politically um, biased, right? It, you got to know somebody then at that point. Um, right. Like the Stanley brothers. Right. <laughs> yeah. So when it comes to the social media aspect of the marketing and the branding, uh, TikTok is really blowing up as a, a platform for, for brands, but the cannabis brands can't really approach that platform. What would you say is a recommendation for not going the traditional cannabis, hey, here's our flower, here's our stuff, and focusing on that brand on TikTok versus, say, uh, Facebook or Instagram? Well, I mean, there's a couple different things. My, my, my buddy, uh, Josh Kesselman, um, he owns Raw, uh, and he has a TikTok account, and he says he gets stuff deleted every now and again. And when him and I chat about what his little strategy is, because he does a lot of video, he's got like 1.4 million followers on Instagram. And, you know, he, um, he does a lot of like how-to videos, especially with a lot of his raw products. So he has to use like, if he's going to roll the joint, quote unquote, he has to use like rice and like <laughs> rice paper if he wants to like put it in one of his like raw rings. I thought I had one over here, but oh, I do. So like if he was promoting this raw ring, he would take a, he, instead of using his own joint papers, he would have to take rice and roll some like sushi paper around <laughs> it and then stick it in there just to be like, and then he bites it. Right. Um, so it's to show that it's not a joint, it's not rolling papers. It's an, you know, it's something that he can eat. And, but even still like that stuff gets flagged. So, you know, it really depends on who you are as a person because it's really about your personal brand. I don't think as a, as a brand, you can really do much other than perhaps create a series of something consistent and funny that could be adopted later into cannabis. But because cannabis is you know, focused on a very specific age demographic, I guess I don't know why I would recommend people try and promote cannabis to children anyways. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, but if you're a person and you're trying to build your personal brand, I think TikTok is great for that. I think you can still have fun. I think you can allude to like, if you didn't like something that I'm working on is I'm not smoking weed in front of anybody, but I'm blowing smoke out. Gotcha. They don't know what kind of smoke that is. <laughs> but if I'm blowing it out without them seeing me rip it, but the intention is there. And then I do something, if I did something silly, well then you know, I'm not violating their terms of service, you know, cause I'm, it's not like I'm drinking, right. you know, either, right. Cause they don't like that either. But if I was to spit something out of my mouth, <laughs> they're not going to be like, Oh, that looks like it's a uh, beer, you know? <laughs> so what would you say is the most successful platform out there for the cannabis brands? What for social media? Yeah. Uh, I think it really depends on what kind of brand you are because, you know, social media doesn't convert into foot traffic for retailers, but is rather more of a brand awareness play. And depending on what your revenue uh, streams look like with respect to how you're utilizing social media, it's really different because you can monetize videos through YouTube and generate revenue through there if you're developing enough content and establishing enough views. But if, you know, you're using Instagram as a, uh, uh, a way to create you know, more brand awareness and perhaps you're using it in uh, you know, the period of when you're dropping off product and you're interviewing the bud tenders that are selling your product and you want to let them be featured on your Instagram. Well, those are great ways to you know, create more experiential marketing during deliveries. So it really just depends. Um, there isn't an answer for that because it, there isn't one answer for everyone. It's really different because again, each social media platform is like a different television channel right? You know, Instagram's like Netflix or like MTV. It's a fucking, it's a hoot. you never know what you're going to get. Right. You know, with Twitter though, it's very, it's like CNN, you know, it's politics pretty much, right? It's a lot of that shit. Yeah. Um, Seems know, like fa got, Facebook is going that way a little bit too. Yeah. You got YouTube and you got all these things that are really different audiences. LinkedIn, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, um, TikTok clearly, you know, Snapchat. Yeah. is a combination of a lot of things too. Um, which platforms would you say to, to brands, obviously, depending on what they are, if, you know, a cultivation, processing, or, or retail, which one would you say to not focus on 
and which one would you say to focus on? If you, if you could recommend two plat one, one for, one against for those I believe brands. in being omnipresent. So if you have the ability to cross purpose content, even to another page that maybe isn't getting its own unique content, um, I would say, gosh, I don't know if I could say two. I would say Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. Good choices. Yeah. I mean, uh, TikTok, the, the videos, say they can take a while sometimes. Uh, I've messed around with TikTok with my kids. Again, it really I, depends on, you're, you know, you're talking about the average, you're talking about those three brand categories. TikTok isn't going to fit in the brand message of a company like that. I, I get that it's important to start a TikTok, but it's, if it's designed for children, are you really being a responsible cannabis company if you're trying to find ways to promote to them? I don't think so. So I'm that's just a, thinking about this from an ethical perspective. That's a very good point. Yeah, that's probably something that you know a lot of people didn't really think about. Because uh, I put, um, for the podcast, I put like the little audiograms and stuff like that on, on TikTok, you know, to kind of increase exposure on the platform saying, I hey. think that's fine. I think as long as it's educational, right. absolutely. You know, but, um, you know, if we're talking about... Uh, you know, content in relation to, you know, making kids feel like it's cool to smoke weed at an early age. I'm not okay with that. You right. Know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Joe Camel, right? <laughs> so the website versus the app, which, uh, which obviously it's, it's, if you don't have a website these days, you, you technically don't exist. Yeah. Would you recommend? So I know apps? where you're going with this already. I already know where you're going with this. Yeah. So I do. Right. Yep. I do. Um, if you're a retailer, uh, you would want to go with, uh, 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 you know, obviously a website, but you'd also want to have your mobile version look like an app. So it'd be like a web app. Gotcha. So it just, it just, uh, rather than having it look like a traditional, um, you know, resized website, you know, they, they call it, um, uh, fuck, why am I, why am I forgetting the name of it? doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> when, when, the web, when the website goes from you know, desktop to tablet to mobile, uh, the responsiveness uh, res uh, feature rather, um, when we develop our mobile versions, we make it look like an app. So that way it only drives traffic to four or five major things that people look for. Since 80% of the customers visiting your website are going to be coming from mobile, right? Um, they're only looking for four or five things. Uh, phone number, hours of operation, address, menu, and specials. And would, right? you, and would you say Those that- should be icons, no different than an app. Okay. And, and would then you stage two is generate revenue and then get an app so that you can use it to send notifications to your customers like text message marketing does. And, and because that notification exists and people just have this dopamine drive where they just don't want the notifications to exist, they're going to open me. it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's me. me too. Um, <laughs> but, then, but then you take that same information and then you repurpose it into text message marketing and you know, you hit them on a different schedule and there's all sorts of stuff. But So with the complicated landscape and, and marketplace that is cannabis and hemp, what is one of your biggest hurdles that you've had to overcome? Uh, I guess I would say just like how, because I've been in it for 11 years, so the landscape has changed so much. So like, you know, I was just having this conversation with uh, a buddy of mine, Juan, who's sitting on the couch over here, high school friend I haven't seen in a while. And um, he, uh, he, he was asking me something similar. And I was talking about, um, you know, just Jeff Sessions and how that was creating, you know, uh, you know, a lack of interest in the industry because people thought that it was going, what we all had built was about ready to get broken down again. And so people weren't investing. And so that's just obvious one, one scenario in retrospect to uh, the last 11 years of instances like that on a larger and smaller scale that have happened that for most business owners would have crashed. But, you know, I think because I started early on enough, I developed enough relationships um, that allowed me to stay and remain sustainable. Um, so, you know, I think the biggest challenge really at the end of the day has just been, the, the ebb and flow of the industry and how much has changed. And, you know, that's why, you know, I have to be a leader in a space like this because if no one else is going to do it, someone has to. And I've been doing it for 11 years and I love it. And I've already made so much change that why stop there, which is why I started high grade hope. That's your nonprofit, right? Yes. Nice. Yeah. And so can you, 
the rebranding process for those brands, um, what states are you working in? Every medical and recreational state as well as country. Because we're going through it right now to set up the brand down here in Vegas. You know, the branding, the marketing aspect and, and all of that, that rigmarole. and roll. Um, I saw an article that Green Entrepreneur did on your nonprofit. You're offering free services, correct? To three selected companies who've been negatively impacted by, you know, the COVID-19 virus, at least in this initiative, this first series, because we're also producing a video series that shares the journey as we take that client or that customer rather, or that brand through the rebranding process or evolution process under our umbrella and uh, high grade hope mentors alike. So, um, and we can only select three because, you know, yeah, you only got so many people, right? It's so expensive, you know what I mean? You know, to go through this entire process from identity, you know, from the ground up identity, packaging, web design, sales material, video, photography, you're looking at like a hundred grand, right? Plus all of the other resources that all of these other high grade hope mentors are providing, like Ricky Williams, Steve D'Angelo, you know, Josh Kesselman, um, Sue Taylor, Kenneth Liu, you know, all of these amazing people. No, you're exactly right, because I went through the rebranding process myself uh, with my hemp store. Uh, I used to have a hemp store up in Eugene, Oregon, but then COVID hit, so had to- you tell me about that? uh, Yeah, so when I was in the military, uh, it was 2017, well, no, it was 2016, uh, Amendment 2 was passing or going through the the process, um, which is completely different than any other state had done because it's an amendment to the state constitution, so now it's a right for the, the residents of Florida to actually have access to cannabis as opposed to a law. We were going to go for one of the licenses. We started br- uh, bringing a team together, industry experts that have been in the space, compliance, et cetera, you know, management and whatnot. Uh, and then they came out with the regulations for the licenses. And Florida, it hit, I think still to date, they had the largest percentage of passage of any med or rec bill, I think. Don't quote me on that. 72% in favor uh, of passing. And so- well, Of course. And, a, and, right? Yeah. Look at and all so, the pharmacies that went out of business. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. And then, so with the, the so much, you know, approval or in favor of, of the, the bill or the amendment, they made it tailored to only about five people in the entire state. You had to have a registered uh, nursery or farm that had, you know, been in operation for a minimum of 30 years. So we're talking generational business. Uh, you had to have, I think five or 10 million liquid. Uh, you, I won't bunch. get into the politics of that. I have my own theory. <laughs> uh huh. It oh, me seems too. like it seems too, like too. policies are very well reserved for um, people who have uh, a very diverse past, but not those that have <laughs> the ability to enter into it, uh, you know, coming from any other industry. So um, I don't know. There's 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 I think there's two reasons for that. There's pros and cons, but that's right. another podcast for another day. Right. But I, I mean, get in trouble. You're right. But in the amount of money that these guys put in, oh, and you also had to be completely vertical. So you had to own seed to sale. Um, so, you know, the space that these guys operated, then, you know, branching out into retail, we're talking about a huge capital investment for these companies. So, you know, obviously these guys, you know, they have the right people in the right places. And so they can safeguard that investment through regulations, which is unfortunate for the people because I think flower just got passed after a lawsuit. Like whenever I left Florida two years after legalization, uh, for med, they, they still were going through a lawsuit to allow flower. So, you know, dispensaries are popping up left and right. They're, you know, true leave. Uh, Certera, uh, you know, some larger uh, names in the area just because, you know, that's, there's only five, I think five or six brands that are there. Uh, I was so just can... talking, I was just uh, on a webinar with uh, the marketing director from True Leave yesterday, and I was just talking to uh, a former employee of Certera literally just before this call. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So I was paying attention to that whole landscape, man. Um, and then, you know, once the, the lies, the requirements came out, it was too high to, to come in, you know, the team just said, Hey, you know, screw it because everybody else had stuff going on. Uh, one of them was a, a huge compliance software guy in, uh, in cannabis. So, you know, he had his, uh, his software, we all just went our separate ways. And, you know, I was finishing up the military the last year and then found out about CBD and hemp because, you know, Charlotte's web was really starting to come out with the Stanley brothers, mm-hmm. uh, low THC, uh, across the country. And so, you know, hemp started coming to the forefront, you know, without the high, it can really help a lot of people. And then, you know, me being a veteran, the THC was really a factor. And so we made the pivot over to hemp. We started doing wholesale, but it was still a lot of education. You know, it's like, what is it? You know, what does it do? Because people didn't know, you know, they thought it was cannabis. They thought it was going to get them high. Uh, so there was just that education, that learning curve for, for a lot of the consumers. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then instead of just doing wholesale, we just decided to, to go retail. We landed in Eugene, Oregon. You know, we didn't want to go to the big city of Portland and Eugene was uh, the good fit. So, Well, it's naturally a good fit, especially because of how much overproduction and cannabis there is. And so a lot of the farmers that had the land, the assets and the equipment was like, fuck, we're not making any money with THC. We need to, or we're going to go out of business. We need to start producing hemp with all of this land and canopy space we have. Exactly. Yeah. And they, you know, the licensing requirements was minimal at the time. I think maybe like a hundred or like a 1500 bucks or something like that for the year. The barrier to entry was very minimal for, for the pivot to hemp. It was a, uh, you know, it was a learning curve for myself in business. Um, and then, you know, every failure leads to a, a success and it, you know, it, there was a silver lining to it. And that's, you know, where I'm at today, you know, with the podcast, having you on the show, uh, you know, helping you guys tell your story, your one-on-one origin stories and you know, what you guys got going on with your brands. And then Sounds like we got to hear your, your origin story. I know, one. right? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll probably edit some of that out. So it's more focused on you anyways. All right. So let's get back into the question. Let's focus on you. So well, what's your take on the, the removal of the, the med program and t- keeping it only recreational in certain States? Like during COVID when certain states dropped their med program and just did- uh, Are you talking about as they became essential? Yes. Well, uh, well, first and foremost, I think that because states, and not all unfortunately, adopted cannabis as an essential um, item uh, in their respective states, it only made the point that cannabis is going to be federally legalized sooner than later. Um, The government obviously recognizes it as a substance that heals- Otherwise, why would they have kept it open? But I also believe that because they also recognize that cannabis retail and production play such a large role in the economy, especially in certain states where uh, a large portion of that taxation is being dedicated to the police force, you better believe that there's also politics involved. So right now we're seeing cannabis deemed as recession proof, which is awesome. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you're you're happy for that one. Um, oh, yeah. So, how soon do you see legalization? I say five years. What do you say? I say two or three. You think right after this election with Biden or re-election for Trump, it's going to be uh, right before the State of the Union? I have my thoughts. <laughs> All right. Maybe we'll, maybe that'll be a topic for another discussion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't so, like talking politics too much. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's cannabis and politics go hand in hand until it's legal. You know, it's unfortunate. They, they, they do. They do. Yeah, unfortunately. So what's, uh, what do you guys have on the horizon for Wick and Mortar? What's, what's something that we should look out for from you guys? Oh, well, we are launching a lot of our own brands. Nice. So that's awesome. Um, and there's not too much more I can tell people about it just yet, just because there's some things that I've got in the woodworks where we're coming out and kind of stealth mode, so to speak. Hey, man, you but, got to. You but, got to. Uh, you know, we're working with a lot of great projects, uh, a lot of great brands. We just, um, we're going to be working with Rick Ross, um, Freeway Rick Ross. So, you know, check out his documentary on Netflix. Uh, you know, we're working on a really cool series called... Um, High on History, which is going to be like drunk history. So nice. <laughs> we, uh, we just cast uh, Ricky Williams, Rick Ross, uh, Wilfred, which is also Jason Gann from that show Wilfred. Uh, we also have Jacob Berger, uh, who plays an Instagram cop um, and happens to be like the blackest white dude I know. So <laughs> it's perfect because like, you know, he uh, and I've, we've already laid out the whole plan to everyone and it's going to be, it's going to be a great production. So we're going to film that in LA, but, uh, I've also recently launched my YouTube channel, um, yep. you know, youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Jared Mursky TV. So people can go check that out. Uh, but tons of new content on there launched uh, a couple new series, like how to series, uh, where I make, um, a bong out of starbursts. <laughs> uh, I, I'm publishing that video today nice. and then uh, I have my pot peeves video, you know, where yeah. I you know, create what amounts to the Bogart or the lighter thief or, you know, someone who g- always gets the joint wet or, you know, all of these <laughs> different kind of uh, things that people do. And so, um, you know, I encourage people to submit their own pot peeves so that I can create those as well. All right. Well, hey, Jared, I appreciate your time. How can every? Obviously, you're you're very active on social media. You just mentioned your YouTube channels. You know, really kicking off. How can people follow along on your journey? 
Uh, you can reach me on you know LinkedIn. Obviously, I'm very active on there as well. And so a lot of the content that I produce is you know more business oriented and driven. Uh, as is, uh, and my my Instagram is you know a bit of that, but it's more of like Jared's personality, which is just <laughs> weird and silly and fun. And I just like to do cool stuff. Hey man, you do you. Uh, YouTube is a combination of both. So um, yeah, I just like to keep it real on there. Nice. Yeah. And we'll put all that stuff below in the description for everybody watching this on YouTube. Cause I'll, uh, I'll do the audio for the podcast and then this video will be on, on the YouTube Very channel. Good. There you go, man. I expect you to teach me some combat skills. I got you, man. I got you. Cool. Uh, we'll I go really to, do. I want to learn. I'm prepared. I want to prepare for the end of the world. as we know it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll go to a range one day, man. Um, I'd like that. Uh, yeah. I mean, here in Vegas, I was just walking through, uh, you know, down the hotel just to walk around. Um, you know, shooting machine guns. There's ranges all over the place over here. Man. Yes. So, so down. Um, and there's also some uh, security companies that uh, that are out here. Some ex Navy SEALs that I know. Um, uh, some hey, I'll tell you, what, you get me a ticket, and I'll we'll produce a ton of content, and we'll do we'll go to the gun range. We'll get fucking super stoned first, and we'll make some fun shit. Hell yeah. Well, oh, cool. uh, hey Jared, thanks again for your time, man. You're a busy guy. Uh, thanks for making time for for us you little bet. folk down here. Hey, no um, worries, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Bye, really bro. do. Yeah. Thanks. I think I appreciate you thinking of me, man. Yeah. No worries. No worries. <laughs> Thanks again, Hep Nation, for sticking around this week for the chat that we just had with Jared Bursky. Learned a lot of good stuff about marketing, so hopefully he provided some good value to you guys going forward with your brands or how you can tweak some things. What troubles are you having out there with marketing currently? With COVID, with everybody being at home, have you had to readjust your brand strategy? Have you had to rebrand? If so, go ahead and leave us a comment below. Let us know. Now, I hope you guys go out there and support Jared on his little venture with YouTube. Another fellow YouTuber, if you will. I'm probably not on the same par as him. Nowhere near it. I don't have a marketing firm behind me. But he's out there crushing it in YouTube and then the other platforms that he's on. So go ahead and follow Jared. Follow his journey. He's got a lot of stuff in the works. So I'm sure you guys would be really excited to see what he's got going on. Because I know I am. I'm a follower of him. He's doing a lot of cool stuff out there. We really appreciate it. him joining the show. If you like the interview, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button to get notified whenever new content's coming out. We've got a lot of episodes in the works. We've got 15 episodes scheduled right now. We've got Franny's Farms out of North Carolina, the first female hemp grower in the state of North Carolina. She's doing the franchise model as well. We've got Dr. Tim Shu from Vet CBD. And we've also got Erica Halverson coming up. She's from Long Beach and she's killing it out there with the hemp paper. If you guys don't know about Erica Halverson, you need to. Tiny E Paper Hemp Company. Tiny E Paper Company? Yes. Her tiny team is doing big things over there with hemp paper, 100% hemp paper. It's huge. She's got a lot of great stuff going on. If you want to get in touch with the show, you can drop us an email at hemp101live at gmail.com. You can also follow us on Instagram at hemp101podcast. I'm on Twitter. Just look up lance.kr. Uh, KR is my last name, correct? That's my handle on Instagram. You can also check me out on LinkedIn. That's the platform I'm most active on. So stay tuned for more. As you can tell, we've got a lot of guests coming up. So this is Hemp 101. Stay tuned for more.